We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for, for uh, everyone that's here today. Thank you for, for showing up. This is always an important meeting when we discuss the priorities of the community. So this is a uh, City of Eagle Pass joint special meeting with the City Council, Maverick County Commissioner's Court, Eagle Pass Independent School District Board of Trustees, Eagle Pass Waterworks System Board of Trustees, Eagle Pass Chamber of Commerce, and Maverick County Hospital District. Today is Wednesday, August 14, 2024. We are, are starting at 3.07 p.m. As far as the city goes, uh, we have Councilman Diaz here present, myself, Mayor Salinas. Unfortunately, we do not have a quorum, um, but I'd like to pass it to, well, I don't think there's any quorums, the, the waterworks, yes. presence of Ms. Diana Salinas, Mr. Morris Lipson, Mr. Benny Rodriguez, and yours truly, Johnny Grace. And so... Uh, Thank you. And for, for Maverick County, we have uh, commissioners uh, Olga Ramos, and uh, is a judge, judge coming? I'm sorry? I, I thought so. Okay. Should, should we wait? Okay, uh, you wanna start with the agenda? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you everybody for being here. We appreciate it. We're uh, gearing up for the legislative sessions coming up in February. We uh, met recently uh, with the committee and we're setting up the dates. It'll be probably the first week or the second week of February when we do the legislative days. Uh, we've been talking to uh, Mr. Morales as well and we'll start getting everything ready but this is, and I've sent out a couple of emails with the legislative uh, items already and the list. Um, if there's any changes that y'all like to do, let me know. But those are kind of the, the, the first uh, draft that we've done. Obviously, there's still a lot of room for change and that's why we're having these meetings to get gearing up for that and for any changes that come up. So. Perfect. And uh, Commissioner Roxy or Ms. Ramos, do you have an agenda you wanna present or before? Right, right. I guess we'll, we'll just discuss what um, the items that, that we have is uh, item one, discussion and update on possible action on the following items. Uh, as far as the city, we do have the Metropolitan Planning Organization, MPO, and we do have Mr. Placido Madera that's gonna give a, a brief presentation. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm uh, Placido Madera, Community Development Director for the City of Eagle Pass. And uh, just want to give a briefing on this. So the Metropolitan Planning Organization is a decision-making body, a local decision-making body that oversees the metropolitan transportation planning for our, our area. Federal law requires a governor to designate an MPO once the urban area exceeds 50,000. So that happened at the last census, which is why we were designated an MPO. So we are now the 24th MPO in the state of Texas. The um, couple of key document, key, thing, key things that need to be done are, it's, it's mainly planning, transportation planning, long range planning, medium term and short range, those are the key things that need to be done by the MPO and by doing those things, uh, it'll, it allows the MPO to receive federal funding that's passed through, through TxDOT, through the state. A big part of it is, is um, public participation, public engagement, so that's included in pretty much everything for the MPO's requirements. Here's a map showing the 24 MPOs. Here's a boundary map where the blue shows the urban area, that's where the 50,000 population is, mostly around the city limits and then some around the Rosita Valley and Casino area and then um, an overlay showing where the MPO area is within the full Maverick County. Um, a couple of things that were covered at the first meeting was establishing bylaws and discussing the UPWP, Unified Planning Work Program, which is a budgeting and short-term planning document and discussing appointment of technical advisory committees. 
And uh, one other thing, as of now, the budget for planning for staff and for consultants or other work that we need to get done as far as an MPO is $180,000 per year. And so with us being really close to the end of this fiscal year, we're essentially going to have two fiscal year budgets to work with, about 360 uh, to get us through fiscal year 25. So it's going to be a big help to get, get going. And a couple key things we'll be working on at the next meeting is adopting the, the short-term planning document, um, discussing interim program of projects, and the public participation plan. So that's the short summary we had on MPOs. Yes, sir. Uh, the funding that comes from the it's FHWA Federal Highway funding that's got, that goes through TxDOT. TxDOT is the one that administers it, but it comes from FHWA. And that's only for planning. There's also separate allocation, which they haven't given us a specific number for, but um, it's a different category of funding for actual projects. So this is just planning dollars that I mentioned. Uh, it'll be a larger dollar, dollar amount for actual projects. Uh, we hope to hear what those numbers will be very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Placido. The next item that we have is at Rio Grande Water Levels and Water Symposium in FAR, Texas. Yes, thank you. Um, you all know, you've been hearing all the issues that, not just us, but statewide, uh, the deals, the, the big problems that we're having with water, or the lack thereof, water. Um, it's, like I said, not just us, but the whole state of Texas, but right now we're kind of dealing with us and the Rio Grande region. Uh, we will be having a symposium next week, Tuesday, and we have two board members that will be going with us. Um, and they're having all of uh, the South Texas area uh, getting together. They have some state representatives, some state senators, and uh, U.S. reps as well that will be attending this meeting, trying to figure out ways to bring more water or have uh, solutions to, to the problems that we're having, especially the, uh, uh, the valley area. But that helps us as well. Uh, we're looking at a second water uh, source right now. We did go with uh, Senator Perry last week to try to push our, our project, and it looks very promising at this point. Uh, hopefully, this is a project that's going to take years, maybe five to ten years uh, to get everything done, but hopefully the sooner we start, the better. Unfortunately, we're looking at a project that's probably going to be uh, $500 million to more than a billion dollars, but I mean, that's just what those projects are. So, Thank you. And, and if anybody wants to add anything, uh, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, these meetings are sometimes kind of awkward because it's like me speaking. And yeah. <laughs> I know that you put this to, together, Mr. Barrera, and we appreciate it. But however, uh, you all let me know how you want to discuss and, and go through this, this meeting, right? So if anybody has any information that they want to share, any topics that they want to discuss, please feel free. Yes, for the record, we have a Councilman Garcia. And also our state representative, Mr. Eddie Morales, present. And Dr. Alvarez, also? Present. <laughs> All right. The next item that we have is the construction of the four-year university and downward expansion. Representative, do you want to maybe say a couple words on this item? or uh, Not to put you on the spot. But <laughs> So my last conversation, yes. you know, we had a, we had a, was it a Zoom or, or a telephone conference, yes. Mayor, Both. with you? Both, right? Yeah. And so what, where we are is basically $800,000 short. And so I reached out to the Speaker uh, of the House asking to see if he could facilitate either working with the Governor's office, seeing if we could find uh, a different source. I, I let him know how, how much the city was involved in it and that they were capped out. I let him know that the developer was also throwing in the 500,000 plus the 120 acres plus the right of way, that the university was so far down the road that they didn't want to change locations. He's aware of all of that. And so we're, we're trying to angle it from, from, from different ways. Uh, he said he was going to get his staff on it. He sounded supportive. He has the Texas State University system. It's also in the speaker's district. And I know that he's worked with Chancellor McCall really well. And so that's why I reached out to him not to throw Chancellor McCall under the bus because we're very happy with the fact that they're also working with us, but we really need to bridge that gap of the 800,000. I also contacted Commissioner uh, Ramos 
Uh, I was under the, uh, I was informed that there was a possibility of the county having COs of a million dollars and we discussed those to see if there was a possibility to access that since they were not being touched. And so we can have some follow up conversations or maybe she has some information also, but believe me, we're trying to look under every rock and we're that much closer. And I mean, it's a $4 million budget for all the infrastructure. We should be there for those that are stakeholders. Mr. Lipson, Mr. Barrera, thank you for all that you've done. The mayor also be being very active and also uh, city, city uh, administration. Yes. And just FYI, this is like a two-parter. We have the actual construction and then we have downward expansion, which is coming up for the next legislative session. And that is also very important that, is there anything that we need to do as yes. a community or? So you can take the resolutions that each one of the entities, and I would highly encourage you, even if it's not just the city and the county, but for example, the hospital district, waterworks, the, the, the Eagle Pass uh, Economic Alliance, the chamber, everyone to draft a resolution in support of the downward expansion so that then we can paper the file and we can show the committee, because remember, we passed it out of the house, and then sent it over to the Senate, and on the last day, at the last hour, everything blew up and it didn't pass the Senate. And so what we're trying to do is we're back to square one, and we have to pass it from on both chambers, but with your help and the possibility, again, of having uh, those that visit, visited the, the, the Capitol and were able to testify in support of it, because I'm assuming that we're, again, have to, we'll be facing some opposition from the other junior college. So what we were gonna ask, are we anticipating Persistence. I'm taking the approach that we are just by every step that they have taken, but they did get uh, five million dollars in additional funding to they were asking for ten. So you would think that they should not be complaining at all, but obviously Don't think that way. the university is a threat and we shouldn't think Don't like think that. that way. Yeah. They and I want to mention it. also that the superintendent was there as part of that uh, congregation that went, and I, I appreciate that because they were able to see, and, and also mean the school district, if y'all can pass that resolution, because then it helps and shows the commitment of all of y'all working together. So thank you, Mr. Mihadis, also for that. Uh, I have one question, just to make sure that we all understand. Um, on the donation agreement and a possible construction agreement, uh, is it in the city's court or is it back in Mr. Levine's court? I mean, is it it's city or over there? We still have it. We actually reached out to uh, uh, State Rep Morales for to get some exhibits that we need to finalize that. Uh, rev the revisions on the donation agreement on our behalf to send back to Mr. W uh, Levine. Okay, well the question, he's out of the country right now anyway, so, but the question would be, when can we put the ball back on his court? <laughs> he's got revision? From his legal team. Oh, okay. I'm checking with Norma. I thought that those had been sent. So I'm checking to make sure that the exhibits are going out to Ms. Sophie and, and Mr. Holmes. Right now, okay, and but 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 you got to keep to you answer your question, Mr. Lipson. I mean, I think very clearly we have maxed out whatever Mr. Levine is willing to propose to 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 offer. I unless you can work some some miracles, but he's offering yeah. to put five hundred thousand dollars in cash, dedicate the rights of way to the one hundred and twenty acres that are being donated, plus the donation of the one hundred and twenty acres. And I think he also is proposing to donate the Eagle Pass Ranch Road, which cost him 1.2, 1.3 1 million dollars. So uh, trying to get more from him is, I, I see it somewhat difficult, and that's why I'm trying to reach out to other state and local agencies to see if they can come up with the 800. And, and the city remains committed to this project, just to, to put it out there for the record. Understand. Yes, and, and, and no doubt about that. City, City Council has uh, committed $1.5 million. Uh, we will be discussing the item at, at a meeting, uh, upcoming meeting, but as of right now, that's, that's the, uh, the, the authority that the, the City Council has, has given for this project. But there, there has to be a way. This is a very, very important project, uh, probably what the most. The school have 800,000? The school? Slaying around. <laughs> 
Just take money. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> That was, an, that was a convenient way out anyway. Uh, no, but I, I do think I'd like to urge everybody, and, and don't misunderstand me. I know that the city is committed, and I know that everybody is. I know Mr. Levine is also. But I think we need to move and move very quickly. Yes. There are some interesting things happening. You mentioned about, about the legislative session coming up. Uvalde's going to do, and that district's going to do all they can to block us. They're not happy that this project, that this university is over here in our area. So that's not going to stop. They're taking steps. They've already changed the name of the, of the, you know, of the Southwest Texas Junior College to Southwest, Southwest College. And uh, regardless of what they tell us, <laughs> I mean, they're not happy of it, which behooves us to you know, make, get the, get it donated, get the agreement on the road, and for construction to start. Once construction starts, I mean, it's not going anywhere. I'm, how long do we have on the $30 million, Mr. Morales? Does that, does that uh, can we lose that? I know that the university has raised concerns over it. I don't have a specific deadline, but they are asking us to move forward. And one of the issues is that we have 30 million and they're already over the 30 million for the first standalone building just because they, they want to go all out on the first standalone building. And so when reaching out to the chancellor, he's like, I'm already over budget on the construction and yet you want me to drop another 800,000 on infrastructure. And so uh, those are the issues, but I don't have a definitive de deadline, but I know that they have raised concerns. And the more that we wait, then, I mean, you know, I mean, the price of steel, labor, you know, we're preaching to the choir, so some of y'all no, no. here with being developers. We were set when we went to see the chancellor for it to open up in fall of 26. We're already offset now, I think, at least to the fall of 27 and maybe 28. We are losing valuable time. We, and I know everybody's doing everything they can. I don't want to be misunderstood. We just, all of us need to push to, if we're, 500,000 or 800,000 short, um, we need to, to come to an agreement so we can get that done. Yeah. I do want to echo what Mayor just said. This is a very important project, so any help, especially if the county can find something, I mean, that would, that would be great. That would be such a help boost. the CEO and Thank you. D, Maverick County Airport and funding. <laughs> Commissioners. We're excited about that one. We have, uh, we finally got approval to move forward with um, $6.9 million. It's $6.5 million for the reconstruction of the runway itself and um, the other 
sign or, or the runway. We already got approval for that, and we are going to auction on the 22nd for the Texas Department text aviation meeting where they are getting ready to officially officially award us this money excellent so, and i'll keep you posted if it all goes well we should be getting the money and we should start construction for for that Great. soon this is another very important project yes i know we've been pushing for that one for for a long time so it's happening it's happening and we're already we already may say you know that project the 57 the i what is it what is that 27 the base that just came in the college the university i mean we're in a great time to be in eagle pass and all these projects are really helping our growth so i think yes. what we're doing here really helps and mm -hmm. i would like to go back in reference to that special water source i was getting ready to comment i want to get ready Tony Gonzalez. And I think right now the, the problem is not so much the funding that there is, but the fact that there is not a lot of water in the river. So that's what really hampers everybody at this point. So. Exactly. And what the problem is that TBQ is counting the TBQ people stationed here and the military as households. They have a, a formula that they use and they're telling you we'll have 380 households with the CBP and you have so many with the Texas National Guard and um, I, I need the water for my constituents. Uh, did you say the wells are drying, Commissioner? Yes. Yeah. The, the people that have water wells, uh -huh. that the wells come into their homes, they're drying, they're wow. too water. So uh, right now I have about 45 homes that their water wells People doing for water right now. Yeah. They're hauling water. They're hauling water. They're hauling water. Yes, I already I, I put an item on the agenda of yesterday's meeting to get approval from the court to extend a, a hand out there to help us with the hauling water. So yeah, it's it's a tough situation right now. What I mean, one question that comes to my mind, and I mean, pardon me, but some of it is Texas National Guard, right? The that belong, I mean, the Texas there's Texas National Guard out there. Yes. And we can't approach the governor's office about. I have. Oh, you have. I have. Mm, okay. I have. So I even Regina Avila reached out to me, and she said yes. Okay. But Regina is with Congressman Tony. Gonzalez. With nothing Tony. to do with the governor, so. No, 
But that we should also become responsible. And what did they say? Look into it to see what they can do. Have you made like a specific request in a letter that you can forward to us so that well, we can? Yesterday, what, uh, that's what the judge was going to do. We got approval from the court to move forward, and he was going to work on the letter first. Can you courtesy copy Definitely. on it so that we can put pressure on the governors? Definitely. The, my chief of staff sent me a text, Mayor, uh, that we are closely monitoring the TxDOT's aviation capital improvement program where we have sent a, a, our comments already for the appropriation of $6.5 million for the Maverick County Airport, and that's already been uh, preliminary approved. So keep your fingers crossed. They've said yes, and TxDOT's moving forward. I don't know if that's the number that you had or if you had a different number, but let us know if 6.5 million is not the correct one so that we can try to. That's, that's happening on the 22nd. Correct. Yes. That, that's what they're telling me, but they're still, from here to the 22nd, things can change, just like it happened on the UETP list. So we need to closely continue to monitor it to make sure that they don't take it out. So that's that's the same the same 6.9, Olga, that you mentioned. You all are talking about the same thing? They mentioned 6.5. I didn't hear. The she, she mentioned 6.9. 6.5 is for the actual. There's two oh, projects okay. that I submitted. And the 400,000. They approved both of them already. They approved both of them. And it's an issue for the approved resolution. They needed that so they can move forward and, and, and fund it. So we are already scheduled. We're on their agenda for the meeting on the 22nd. And uh, we're, I'm going to all say, you let me know. I want to make sure that we get that one. Great. Eagle Pass Independent School District facilities and opposing of school vouchers. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Well, I was hoping Mr. Morales could probably help with something that uh, to increase the funding for border for border communities. You know, I do know that we do have. Uh, I know the governor came over for 30 minutes and left, but maybe he can also see the need that we have due to the immigrants. You know, our facilities are kind of dilapidated already and uh, funding hasn't changed since 2019. So maybe we can come up with something for, for our facilities, some uh, the instructional facilities allotment or any type of uh, funding, even if it's something that we can pass a bond. Uh, I do know it's kind of hard kind of difficult right now with the with the second item we have because really the vouchers are really holding everything up but I do know that Mr. Morales is always champion for us and I, I think those are the two items that we really need are pressing for us right now um, since our funding has changed since 2019 and cost of uh, the cost has gone up drastically for everything we do so uh, hopefully that's something that we can uh, see if uh, we can sort of, uh, you know, push as much as we can because I know it's a it's a difficult item right now in, in the capital. Yeah, the last two days there's been public education committee hearings. If you all are really want to be nerds on public education, you can join those through Zoom, and they've been really, really active. The the witnesses as well as the committee members on the house because of this issue and just a really quick recap because I'm still running into teachers um, and staff that have no idea what private vouchers are and how they have a negative impact on public education so I need you all to at least hopefully you know some of the information that I'm going to share with you 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 store it and and you use it and be those ambassadors to go out there because we really are voting against our interests 
when we start supporting certain candidates that have that don't have the the well-being of our, our public education system and our teachers. We currently have, and this, this is just for some, one reason or the other, the governor has made it, it wasn't even a priority at the beginning of session towards the, uh, once the session st got started last January, then he started this private vouchers thing, thinking that he could do it and get on the national stage. And what it is, it's taking money from public education and then rolling it over here to, to private uh, schools for use with no, um, no, no checks and balances the way public education has to go through all these checks and balances and the standardized testing and the requirements for administration and teachers. And so that's the impact that you, they just wanted, a, uh, for example, the last number that they agreed to was, okay, let's give $8,000 per student to, uh, to a family, to a, a husband and wife or their, the parent, so that then they can take their child and they can put them into private school. Many of these private schools will charge more than just the $8,000. So if you give a middle class person in Texas $8,000, many of my constituents in House District 74 have told me that's not gonna do anything when it's 12,000 or 15,000 for the whole year to cover one child. And so it does no good to have $8,000 so you wouldn't take it because you wouldn't be able to take, send your, your kid. Where are you gonna come up with the difference? So that's one thing, right? And the second thing, in House District 74, there's very few private schools. So the, in rural parts like my district, public, the public school system is basically the backbone of our communities. It's the Friday night lights, it's where the teachers and administrators and everyone you know, congregates and has a common unity. So to destroy that, for the last 15 years, we have seen a systematic defunding of public education. And so now the lieutenant governor and the governor create this problem for the last 10, 15 years of lowering and lowering public education. They create the problem and now they wanna come in with the solution and say, okay, the public school system is failing, let's now take the kids to private school. And then when we tried on the Senate, there were countless amendments where we would try, okay, if you want to pass private school vouchers, let's make sure that we put the same conditions that the public schools have to go through of accepting every kid. If you have a special needs kid, if you have a certain re religious uh, uh, private school that they'll accept any sort of kid. And every one of those amendments, go back, they failed. They didn't wanna have any of those conditions or restrictions to put them on par with public education. So we are taking the position that we should fully fund public education. We need another 35 to 40 billion dollars just that we're 43 in the nation. And that 35 to, to, to 40 billion dollars will just take us to the middle of the U.S. states. But Texas has never just wanted to be mediocre. And so I think we need to do more, but I think that's a first step. We've also proposed legislation where we would start our teachers, for example, at uh, around $70,000, um, and, $75,000. And also, if you, if I can give you, once we know the bill, we can give you the bill numbers so that you can pass resolutions in support of, of those issues, because that'll really help us also try to push the envelope there. The meetings the last two days that were taking place it's, it's sad. There was countless of administrators and teachers from the state of Texas that were there to testify against the private vouchers. And they let out of state interest groups or experts that were in support of private vouchers come and testify first. And it is a tactic that is used by the opposition so that they can tire the, the other side that's sitting there for hours before they testify. Sometimes they give, give up. It's, they're there at eight o'clock in the morning because the, meeting, the committee meeting starts at eight and it's eight o'clock in the afternoon and you still haven't gotten called. You're gonna, you're gonna say like, no, you know what, that's it, I can't, I gotta, go, I gotta go home to my family. And so those are the tactics that are being used right now, but you should have seen the last two days, we've, our staff and, and Helen and myself, we've kept touch on those committee hearings because they're available through Zoom. And people and Texans and families and parents, they are livid and upset and I think it's gonna show in November, but it's. It's up to us to make sure that we educate 
our teachers, our administrators, and, and just the general public also so that they are aware at how much we're, we're losing. You said uh, we're like 43? Yes, sir. That's lower than mediocre. That's kind of on the lower end. Yeah, but, but even getting us 35 to 40 billion, for example, yeah. a year will just get us to the middle, to the 23, 25 out of 50 states. So now, we still need to put double to, down and put to more. To add another issue that I think we're all looking at and we're seeing, and you did mention if we can bring up the pay for teachers, because right now we're, we still need about 20 teachers or so, and most of them are the elementary. This is just us here. Statewide, there's becoming a problem. Um, the student teachers that we used to see used to be, what, 10, 12, 14, whatever. Now you're looking at four, five at most. So that's going to be a big issue going forward, and it's becoming a bigger problem as 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 we go. So we would like to see if do you have to vacancies? A lot of vacancies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's why I mean, I mean do you, Mr. Barra, do you? So about twenty. Yeah, but I mean, do you do you blame the students that are coming in? Think about it. No. When when they're being attacked when the public school system and teachers and the supposedly woke, woke agenda and how they're you know, trying to gear students into a certain type of philosophy or, or mentality, all those issues are having an effect on recruitment, on kids wanting to go in, on, on students not believing that what they're doing, and, and it's a thankless job. I know I couldn't do it, and that's why I appreciate, and we do our little part in making sure that we support uh, public school teachers. But it is a thankless job. I don't think they get paid enough, and that has to go up first and foremost. Yeah. There's, we gotta relax some of the, and we were just talking about this yesterday. It's something to bring up. Maybe the legislature can help us out. You know, we have. Um, nepotism, right at this point, and we're trying to see if they can help us out at least with the teacher side of things to try to hire you know, family members that want to come in from anybody, uh, from any of ours or anything, just tr something that help us out. So your, your, your internal nepotism rules or this is a state statute that prohibits no. the hiring? The state? The state? So let's entertain. Thing that they were talking about yesterday, that they want to look with legal to see what can be done because, I mean, at the end of the day, we live in a small community and who's not going to know somebody here? I mean, it's just uh, at the end of the day, it's short with teachers and, and they're, they're lacking. And uh, again, I mean, who wants to, you know, at this point, teachers are running just tired and, and you know, overworked and, and there's just the pay is not there. And, and so, I mean, you got people taking work home, and of, of course, everybody always has to take work home, but now I think it's, it's everybody is just tired and running just low on fumes, and, and there needs to be something to revamp the, you know, the, the, the school districts more than anything. Yes, and, and there's no question, there's no question that, that public education continues to be uh, under the weather. Uh, but Johnny brings up a good point about nepotism. If that is a, a state law or an impediment, is, is there not an opportunity for something to be put in where waivers could be provided for communities like ours? Yes. We definitely can. We, we'd be happy to work. I didn't know it was an issue, so I mean, it's, thank so you for bringing maybe, it up. That's what these workshops maybe not are for. Changing the law or whatever, if that's too difficult, but providing waivers. I mean, it's just like Chris says. In a community like ours, the, the thing that's happening, and I know of, a, of at least one case, is you get, uh, you know, children and grandchildren of, of people that are in public service, 
that want to come back to Eagle Pass and teach, and they they can't do that, and then they're having to go to the towns around us to mm -hmm. to go find a, a teaching job. Can and we get a letter from uh, school legal that, that that's asking either for a waiver or a legislative change? That way, then we can forward that to the TEA. And, and one last question. In your opinion, does, I know the November election changes the Constitution. I mean, how the, the Texas Congress is composed um, on this voucher situation. Is it pretty clear cut that, that you know, the majority is going to have enough to, to pass the voucher? You have a unique, that's a great question, and you have a unique situation where the governor actually, in the longest time, this has never happened. For those that love state politics, and if you haven't, you definitely should download and follow Texas Take as your, one of your podcasts, because they're in 30, 45 minute increments, they give you the lowdown for the week before on what happened in the ledge. Texas Take. Um, so, in, in essence, what happened in the March primary was that 20 rural Republicans, reasonable, most of them that you're able to work with because they're salt of the earth type of just folks that just represent rural districts like me, 20 of them got challenged by the governor and they put millions of dollars against his own incumbents, Republican incumbents in the March primary and put up, challenged them on the primary by other, he hand selected other Republicans that would be for the private vouchers and against these 20 reasonable Republicans. About 13, 14 of them lost straight out in the March primary. Really? Yes, including the speaker was this close to losing because he did not, uh, they think that he did not try hard enough to pass the House, to pass the private vouchers through the House. The speaker is a moderate, represents a rural community, understands about why the public school system is so important. And so he let the House members, the 150 of us, work through that. And eventually we were able to procedurally stop that legislation from moving forward. So the lieutenant governor and the governor uh, took it out against the speaker. They dropped millions of dollars against the speaker's own race. They found him a challenger in the March primary. And he barely came in second after the primary and was in a runoff. And so everybody thought, that's it, he's done. And they, he and his team were able, in the, in the runoff, were able to uh, be successful. And, and they got that victory. Uh, but not, again, not until millions of dollars were, were spent out there in, in, in his district. But now you have a speaker who is very much upset at the lieutenant governor at the governor for what they did, and then also at the Attorney General Paxton, because Paxton also came out uh, against them and dropped millions of dollars because the speaker initiated the investigation that led to the impeachment of the Attorney General Paxton also. And so there was, there's a lot of inner, in, in fighting over there in the Republican Party. So to say that, I think the speaker's gonna be successful again, that's my take. He's going to win the speakership, it's based on a vote, start January, all 150 members vote. Any Speaker of the House, because of the makeup, we have 84 Republicans right now, and we have 60, 64, um, 65 Democrats. They need Democrat votes to get a Speaker in there, wherever they get. And so we've been able to work well with Speaker. Every There's two challengers already for the Speaker. Two other House members have uh, announced that they wanna run for Speaker. Both those challengers have said that if they win, they will not give a Democrat a chair position or a vice chair position on any committee, which is not the way Texas works. We've always had, even though you're on the losing end, let's say, of that party that's not in power, you always have cooperation and, and a willingness to still name uh, dem uh, uh, you know, uh, members of the other party into chair and vice chairs. And so I think that that's, also, uh, that's going to, the, the, the speaker has appointed chairs and vice chairs from the opposing party. He has made no mention of wanting to change that. One of the things when we got up, uh, get up there in Austin, they'll tell us we are not DC, we're different in Texas. 
And that's what makes us different, that we're able to share that power and work and sit amongst Republicans, independents, and Democrats on the House floor. When you go to Congress, everybody separates. They don't even, they even get threatened or, or possibility of, of sanctioned if you're seen out at lunch with somebody from the other party. And in Texas, it doesn't work that way, and I think that's what makes us unique. And I think that for as much as they're saying, hey, we don't want to turn into that mess that's up there in D.C., every action that right now, unfortunately, the extreme far right is taking is very much into taking us into the mess that's up there in D.C. So factor that in mind. I know I, I, I don't want to turn this political, but I think it is super important for you to know who we, in our constituents who, who we're voting for because it's having an impact at the local level and, and, and in everything that we want. So, so to say that, I think three or four were able to, 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 to win. The speaker was able to win. And now, uh, like I said, I spoke to him yesterday. He's not going to take this lightly, what happened to him. And so he is he's ready for battle. You would, you would think that, Commissioner, but I have visited with a number of constituents here in Maverick County, and I'm surprised by the position that they still take in supporting certain candidates or that they're unaware of what's actually happen, happening at the, at the state level with the statewide office holders and then also at the, at the federal level. So I think it takes more, not just assum assuming. I mean, I'm even thinking of doing op-eds continuing op-eds. I try to post as much of this on social media, but it would really help if we have a unison like this workshop that never, you know, prior to us starting it in 2020, 2021, I mean, it had never done before, and I think it's really pushed the envelope as to what this community is getting at the state and federal level. And to answer your question, we have, uh, we're working with Dr. Carlos Rios in Del Rio, the San Felipe superintendent. We're working with Michelle uh, uh, Reinhardt, who's the Alpine superintendent. She's uh, amazing. She's an MIT graduate. She's gone and testified up there in the Capitol, and she just messaged me yesterday because she was very actively watching the proceedings uh, and the committee hearings, and we're coming up with even more legislation to try to address some of these r rural districts not getting their full funding. So, and, and El Paso also is, the, the whole delegation is working with the El Paso district. So. In, 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 in short, West Texas is getting it too, and they're very active, at least in my district, but I think that, that it really does take much more of educating the masses and making sure that they're aware how this is impacting them. Thank you, Representative. Uh, next, if we could get an update from uh, our friends at the Maverick County Hospital D District. Anyone? I mean, feel free to.
Jorge, do you envision those getting added to the legislative priorities letter, or do you want to separate? Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, th thank you. Thank you for the update to uh, Maverick County Hospital District. Mr. Eladio, do you have anything you want to contribute? Excellent. With respect to that, do you need anything from us, like I letters of support? Know, uh, we want to take one, which is the that we need. One, we feel that then the pre application process starts and we'll move everything else. Nice. But we will definitely reach out to you. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, yes. I may? Yes, yes. I know that you and I have had co communications about the hospital and the, the money that it has spent on, on immigrants mm -hmm. on the emergency services and that you don't get to recoup those. We've gone to the governor's office. We've tried to see if Operation Lone Star can appropriate some of that funding. We're also working with the Ledge Council to see if we can tweak Operation Lone Star so that for this coming session, we can have those sorts of reimbursements to you all. But my question to you is you recently uh, hopefully you saw that the governor was trying to do a, a resolution where it was asking every one of the hospitals to to ask certain more. Starting, starting November, and we're going through the process of the attorney trying to figure out how we're going to do that. Yeah. We're going to have to ask all patients their new salary, unfortunately. Uh, that question is not just right now. We don't feel like it's either easy or not or yes or no. So starting November, we will have to do an inspection order for the governor. We are now going to ask that question. No reimbursement for that. Well, not not to the not to the, the, for, the hospital, but Operation Lone Star does okay. allow for this. I know the city has received mm -hmm. and, and the county and different departments also have received some some money and reimbursements. The other thing, so thank thank you for that. And I know so, so in case some of the so some of the public servants here, you may get these complaints once they start that process, and so you need to understand the reasoning behind it. And I, and I did have, right, I mean, part of it is like, why are you prying into more, who's gonna re wanna release that information? What effect is it gonna have? Are they gonna think that they're gonna call the cops? All of that. But at the same time, I understand why it's important for communities when we have limited resources and, and $1.5 million is going out from the Fort Duncan Medical Center on a regular basis to treat these emergency services. And that's o the only thing that they, that, uh, that immigrants, actually qualify, just emergency services to keep them stable and that and that's it. But still racks up a huge bill. Absolutely. The, the other thing is I know in the, that I've received some departments that have asked for me to work with the governor's office because either they were not timely in making their additional request for Operation Lone Star funds. And so I would ask every one of the agencies here please visit with their, their staff because while we're happy to do this, it creates a lot of work. If we were just to submit the application and the grant request within a timely fashion, we wouldn't be caught in a situation where we're trying or having to pull some 
it's a miracle with the governor's office and to already, they've already said no to the agencies and then we're trying to have a, a different response and try to appeal that, you know, informally. So please stay on top of that because it really, it really helps. But I'd still, our staff is, is there and we'd be happy to continue to help. So I, I just want to comment on, obviously there is a financial burden to providing un uncompensated care to immigrants. But uh, as we approach the topic, and I think it, it, it would be a worthwhile conversation um, um, to have maybe within a public health committee, um, people, if denying care and denying services to people in our community, it, it's, it raises public health concerns, right? So people are coming into our community and not receiving the care that they need. Um, if, if there's uh, issues that come up with, for example, infectious diseases, uh, multiple deaths in our community. You know, we've, we've discussed topics like that before. Um, I, I think that the consideration of the financial impact to, to our local hospitals, uh, that seems like a much more viable, safe option uh, to make sure that we get that communication with the governor going to make sure that the hospitals are receiving the care, the, the compensation that they need versus just closing hospital doors for people. It, it will eventually become, right now it's a hospital issue, it will eventually become a community issue. Yeah, there's a federal mandate, if, if it's an emergency, you have to stabilize the patient and that's it. It, it's not about denying the service, and, I, I, and obviously the mandate is coming from, from the governor, right? It's not about denying the service. It's that simple question is, is, a, is a barrier to care. Yeah. And this is only through an executive order that the governor issued, so there still may be legal challenges that the executive order will face as to whether it could even be implemented. Is there any guidance on, so once you ask the question and maybe possibly enforce it, if there's a federal mandate not to negate services, what, what, the what is the... Is just to collect the data. The services will not be refused. We will still okay. see the patient, we're still gonna take care of them. At the end of the quarter, and it's still the 2005, we're just gonna collect the data and send that to, you know, they wanna know how many patients we saw that were illegal and how much it cost to take care of them. Basically, that's all the information that we're gonna pass on to the government. Get the medical bill. Well, the, you really want the ticket to pay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and what the governor really wants is just the number and the dollar value, so that then yeah. he can then plaster it and sure. say, look how, my, how, for, how, for how much purposes. this is costing the state of Texas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Mi yes, May yes. I? Mr. Morales, when you visit with the governor last year, because we were servicing CBP agents and in reference to the, to the water, I requested funding through Operation Lone Star with uh, Mr. Iracheta we submit our county attorney submitted an application specifically for our water plant because they were consuming a lot of our water and we did submit an operation loan start request and we were denied anything further on this item okay yes no, we still have an update on, on construction of Loop 480, so, but yes, you can go ahead. I think we've sent, they've been invited. Yeah, we always invite them to every, every. I think it would be good to invite them. I mean, this is always more like a brainstorming group with all the community. So the next meeting, we will extend an invitation.
Through the university? Yeah. Who is um, Johnny still involved in? I don't think so. Middle Rio Grande? We need 800,000. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Excellent. If, if UMC can do a letter of support also on these batter, on the batter women, for example, from the legal site, we have repeatedly been asked by those running the battered women's shelter that they need more resources, they need more housing, they need an actual standalone facility so that they can house these children and mostly women that end up seeking services and, and at, at all, you know, uh, times of, of, of the hour. So I know that from a legal in the Maverick County Bar Association has been a, repeatedly approached about trying to do something also. Um, so that is definitely something that I think if you get UMC and if you get the hospital, if you get the hospital district, if you get the, the, the school, city and county all in support, could probably help to, to get something along those lines. I Jorge, do you envision probably one more meeting and then we that, that would be finalized the the letter or? I, I think, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as we speak about domestic violence, I think it's just about time where, you know, we need to create something that's unique to the residents of Maverick County. Uh, you mentioned the women's shelter. The women's shelter is uh, it's 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 a Carrizo based. It's it's a yeah. regional thing. They, that's right? why they want a facility here in Eagle Pass so that they're not trans having to transport but kids. Their headquarters and their people and their staff are are are, are in Carrizo. We need something. Mm -hmm. I get it. This huh. we need something yeah. that's community driven, that's put up by us. You know, so if we can collaborate between, you know, the healthcare entities, uh, maybe the hospital uh, hospital district and UMC. And, and some other community agencies, uh, we've we've already done some work, some legwork to, to 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 start that off, right? But but there's a lot of barriers to uh, victims in this community receiving the care that they need. A big part of that is because the people that are obtaining the infrastructure grant funding, they're not they're not from here. They're not they don't they don't care as much about the residents of Maverick County as we do. Right, and this is the community that is seeing the most growth in right. the region, so it should rightfully be here. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, if, if you're not, I've said it before. If you're not from here, you, you have to think about what you know, what you're going to be doing here. How long are you going to stay? Uh, so sometimes it's not tough bringing them; it's tough keeping them. Yes. And then when you know, it's that's why we go back to that uh, nepotism and all that stuff that says if, if you can't, you know, if you can't bring them, like you got to breed them. Like we have to, you know, make our own. You know, our own people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's serious. Like, Sounds it's, funny, but it's it, true. It, but it's true. It's like, you know, it, 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 if you're from here, you're more willing to come back here. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Mr. Johnny? Several of them are from here, from Eagle Pass, and they work here, and they're familiar with the community. And, and they, they, you know, but they go back and forth to, right. to, to Carrizo. But uh, uh, she was, she, she did indicate to me that she's actively looking for, to, to, to have a facility here so she can house 
have staff here and they can provide uh, additional services to the community. I don't know if that's much needed. Mayor, if I may add on the shelter. Yes. I remember last time that we went out to the PDHCA to have some funding, uh, one of the reasons they gave us that we did not get funding was because we did not own the building. Now, keep in mind, or actually, keep in mind that we're not looking, when you talk about a shelter, it's actually, I mean, you're going to have to get a home. You know, it's not going to be like a, you know, the old Sears building. or It's, it's actually a home. And so what, what, what didn't help us is when we applied, we didn't know. We were looking at a, at a home that was owned by Mission Water. Right. And so had we owned the that. building, I think we would have been in better shape. So I guess as we move forward in that, we need to make sure that whatever 